Thank you, everybody. Good morning. It's great to be back at AHS. Uh, this is the sixth AHS event that I've attended. First one was at UCLA, then Harvard, Atlanta, Berkeley, Seattle, and now here. And I always enjoy my time here, so it's good to be back. Okay. About a year ago, I gave a TED Talk at Marin entitled, entitled, How to Optimize Light for Health. I was planning on giving a slightly abbreviated, or excuse me, expanded version uh, of that talk here today, but I decided to go in a bit of a different direction, yet still focusing on the effects of light and health. So let me start off by actually giving you a more abbreviated version of what that TED Talk was about. To begin, I'd like to discuss humans' relationship with light. And we can look to certain modern-day hunter-gatherer communities to illustrate this. In a study of some of these people by Jerry Siegel and Jerome Yedish, it was observed that they wake up about an hour before sunrise, and they get peak light exposure between the hours of 9 a.m. and noon, at which point, they will seek shade during the midday heat. After dark, they are exposed to light only in the forms of fire, the moon, and the stars. Now, humans' relationship with light had been constant for millennia, all the way up until 1879, when Thomas Edison patented the incandescent light bulb. Incandescent lamps emit a warm tone of light similar to that of sunset. However, they consume a lot of energy, rightfully worrying policymakers about their contribution to global warming. So in attempts to be more efficient, humans invented compact fluorescent lighting. Now, these bulbs are more efficient, but they emit an unnatural spectrum of light, overrepresenting certain blues, oranges, and greens, in their spectrum, and they flicker, causing eye strain and fatigue. Literally, nobody likes compact fluorescent lighting. Right. Then, in 1992, the Japanese invented light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. They are bright, they are far more efficient, and they can be dimmed. And they can be used not only in lamps, but also in screens like TVs and tablets and smartphones. And all this lighting technology has fundamentally changed the way that humans live. Americans now spend 90% of our time indoors. And according to a survey by the National Sleep Foundation, nearly all US adults have a screen in their bedroom and use that screen within an hour of going to bed. So compared to our ancestors, we now get longer periods of light within a 24-hour period. Strange patterns of light for a given time of day. For instance, you could get a full spectrum bright light signal right before bed. We experience less time with darkness and we get less sunshine. And then in, the in that talk, I posed the question, but does all this matter to our health? And then I spoke about the various ways, like how strange lighting patterns and less darkness associate with, and perhaps even evoke, undesirable effects on the healthful functioning of the human body. Now today, at this point, this is where I will deviate considerably from that TEDx talk. So for the rest of the day, I'm going to focus exclusively on the health effects of sunlight. Here's the agenda for the talk. First, I will be discussing facts about sunshine as a primer. Then I'll cover the negative aspects of sun exposure, the positive aspects of sun exposure. Neither of those two talk, uh, parts of the talk will be comprehensive or exhaustive. And then I'll share some closing thoughts uh, about this topic in general, and I'll take some questions. Okay, so while this will not be a physics lecture, 
Uh, let's start by discussing some relevant information about sunlight. But a quick side note, if you haven't watched the series called One Strange Rock by National Geographic, starring Will Smith and several US astronauts, you should consider, consider doing so. It's excellent. And episode three focuses entirely on, sun, uh, on the sun. Very, very interesting and well produced. Has anybody seen it? Oh my gosh, okay. Write a note. Oh, one person, one person, okay. <clears throat> okay, sunlight is composed of three major wavelength bands. From the smallest to largest, we have ultraviolet light, which has a wavelength of 100 to 400 nanometers. Visible light, which has a wavelength of 400 to 800 nanometers. And infrared radiation, which includes some wavelengths above 800 nanometers. While red and infrared light is interesting, a very interesting subject, I will be focusing, I will not be focusing on those frequencies for the, for the talk. Okay, now if we break down ultraviolet radiation further, you have ultraviolet A, B, and C. Let's go in reverse order from shortest wavelength to longest in the band. UVC is between 100 and 280 nanometers, and it is prevented from reaching the Earth uh, by the ozone layer. UVB is 280 to 315 nanometers, and it comprises about 5% of UV, UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface. And UVA is 315 to 400 nanometers, and it comprises 95% of solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface. So let's talk about the characteristics of UVA light some more. Exposure to UVA radiation still occurs when the UV index is low, including winter during uh, cold climates, in the morning hours, in the late afternoon, uh, and even through a window. And by the way, windows do block UVB from uh, block radiation from getting to, the, to, to you. All right. UVA does possess risks to human health because of its capacity to induce pro-inflammatory cytokine production in the skin, and also it degrades vitamin D in the skin as well. But it also may induce the release of nitric oxide from stores in the skin, and this can uh, improve and lower blood pressure. We'll discuss nitric oxide more in a bit. Okay, now, the amount of UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface at any given place and time is influenced by a variety of factors, including time of day and season, geographic latitude, and altitude. And I have an interesting comment to make about latitude. Uh, you see blood pressures rise linearly the farther you get from the equator. And cloud cover and surface type. So think of water, or even better yet, snow, and how they reflect UV radiation. Personal factors affecting a person's response to the solar ra radiation include things like genetics and age, exposure history, and tan. So tan being your more current exposure to sun. And exposure history means how many sunburns did you get as a kid, etc. It's the lifetime accumulation of your sun relationship, your relationship with the sun. And of course, clothing and vitamin D status. And then diet, interestingly, and sunblock. OK, so now let's transition and we'll talk about the negative health effects of sunlight, which is primarily what we hear, uh, certainly I did growing up, by dermatologists, et cetera. The sun, the sun will kill you, right? OK. So there are legitimate risks to sun exposure. Excessive skin exposure can cause skin erythema, or reddening, of the skin, O edema, or tissue swelling, and inflammation and photoaging. Total UVR exposure and excessive exposure resulting in sunburns, particularly in childhood and adolescence, significantly increases the risk of developing certain cancers. And there are ocular effects, in, too, including cataracts. Now, Ultraviolet radiation can cause DNA damage in several ways. First, both UVA and UVB 
wavelengths directly damage DNA through the formation of pyrimidine dimers, which are molecular lesions formed from thymine and cytosine bases in DNA. They are induced when an ultraviolet photon causes two consecutive bases on a strand to stick together, which alters the structure and possibly the base pairing. Now, DNA repair processes can often recognize the problem, remove the crosslinks, and restore DNA back to the correct sequence. But if they're not repaired, they can interfere with DNA replication, which leads to mutations and sometimes cancer. In fact, pyrimidine dimers are the primary cause of melanomas in humans. Ultraviolet radiation also damage, damages DNA by inducing reactive oxygen species that cause oxidation of DNA bases and by activating MAP, MAP kinase pathways. And it can also promote tumor growth through immunosuppression. We'll talk more about immune responses in a bit. Now, UVA, UVB, excuse me, is what causes you to get a tan. It is also far more potent and carcinogenic than UVA at causing genetic mutations and suppressing immune responses at an equal dose. But again, the relative amounts of UVA versus UVB that reaches the sun surface is vastly more. 95% right? of the solar radiation is UV, UVA. So UV <coughs> radiation's ability to cause genomic damage is likely the initiating factor in the pathogenesis of skin cancers. Let's talk about cancer now. Cancers of the skin are by far the most common of all types of cancers. Most people are di more people are diagnosed with skin cancer each year in the U.S. than all other cancers combined. This is all NIH data from SEER, which stands for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Results Program. And for melanoma of the skin, there is a lifetime risk of 2.3% of, uh, of men and women will be diagnosed with it at some point in their lifetimes, which represents 5.5% of all cancers and 1.2% of all cancer deaths. For basal and squamous cell skin cancers, there are about 3.3 million diag diagnosed with basal and squamous cell cancer each year. Now, eight in 10 of these diagnoses are basal cell cancers. Uh, now, the exact number of people who develop or die from basal and squamous cell uh, skin cancers each year is not really known for sure. But let's take a look. Now, so now we, we've talked a little bit about incidents and cancers. It is a serious risk. We talked about some mechanisms about why it occurs. But for the remainder of the talk, I'll be discussing potential health benefits and mechanisms for sunlight exposure. And I'll briefly discuss cancer and immunity and autoimmunity. But the primary focus of this section will be on fat regulation and metabolism. And there's very interesting information there. Let's start with, let's do a little survey of different types of cancers first. Breast cancer, the lifetime risk is approximately 12.8% of women will be diagnosed with female breast cancer at some point in their lifetimes, which represents 15.2% of all new cancers and 6.9% of all cancer deaths. Uh, by the way, for comparison, on the next few slides, I have put the statistics for melanoma as a reference at the bottom. So you'll see that for every type of cancer that I show. Prostate cancer, approximately 11.6% of men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer at some point in their lifetimes, which represents 9.9% of all uh, cancer cases and 5.2% of all cancer deaths. For colorectal cancer, the lifetime risk is 4.2% of men and women uh, will be diagnosed at some point in their life, which represents 8.3% of all new cancers, and remarkably, 8.4% of all cancer deaths. So you can see that colorectal cancer is comparatively extra, extra deadly. And non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lifetime risk is 2.2% of men and women will be diagnosed in their lifetime. It represents 4.2% of all new cancer cases and 3.3% of all cancer deaths. Now, why mention these different cancer statistics in a session that is about light and health? because chronic but not acute exposure to UV radiation associates with significant decreased incidence of breast cancer, 
prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Cancer survival is also associated with better responses in patients who have higher cumulative sun exposure or who are diagnosed in summer or autumn. And the authors of this study had attributed this activity to increased circulating 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form of, of, of vitamin D. Okay. Oh. Sun exposure is in inversely associated with some, but not all, infections, including tuberculosis and acute respiratory tract infections. An increased uh, sun or UV radiation exposure is associated with decreased development and severity of immune-driven diseases, including autoimmune diseases such as arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and multiple sclerosis. And the evidence in multiple sclerosis is particularly strong, where increased sun exposure and serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D associates with decreased risk of multiple sclerosis, particularly in children and adolescents. And allergic conditions such as asthma, and anaphylaxis. You see decreased risk for this or associations for it. There are many pathways by which exposure to ultraviolet radiation suppresses immunity. This occurs through multiple mediators and activation of multiple different cellular path networks. Um, and it occurs not just locally by the skin, but also systemically. And interestingly, some of these mediators and immune network effects may be beneficial for the control of metabolic disorders, which we'll talk about in a bit. In fact, we'll talk about it now. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about light, fat regulation, and metabolism. And the topics to be covered here are vitamin D, nitric oxide, POMC, which stands for pro-opio-melanocortin, and something called melanopsin. Let's start with vitamin D. It's a fat-soluble hormone that is vital for maintaining human health. It is needed for the homeostasis of plasma levels of calcium and phosphorus. And when human skin is exposed to UVB radiation, vitamin D3 is produced from 7-dihydroxycholesterol via pre-vitamin D3. It's also obtained dietarily through vitamin D-rich foods and supplements, although most people acquire most of their vitamin D through uh, sun exposure. Okay, vitamin D deficiency is defined as 25 hydroxy vitamin D of less than 50 nanomoles per liter and low circulating 5 hydroxy vitamin D levels are associated with obesity, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. But a meta-analysis by Autier did, uh, did not find support for a benefit of vitamin D supplementation for weight loss, coronary artery disease, hypertension, or reducing signs of cardiometabolic risk, such as glucose tolerance, insulin sensitivity, or circulating lipids. Perhaps 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels are just a proxy for sun exposure. And other ultraviolet radiation-inducing mediators like nitric oxide may be responsible for the positive health outcomes associated with increased circulating 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. Okay, so now let's talk about nitric oxide. Skin exposure to ultraviolet radiation triggers nitric oxide release from dermal storage sites into the bloodstream. And in a study by Liu et al., whole body radiation of healthy adult volunteers with ultraviolet radiation A decreased blood pressure and the effect was sustained for about 30 minutes. And this effect associated with increased circulating nitrates. So you see, you get UVA exposure, your blood pressure drops, it lasts for 30 minutes, and that associates with circulating nitrite. What does this have to do with fat regulation and metabolism, you ask? Well, in a study published in 2014 in the Journal of Diabetes, researchers showed that ultraviolet radiation suppresses obesity and symptoms of metabolic syndrome independently of vitamin D in mice fed a high fat diet. And to test the hypothesis, researchers also gave mice a nitric oxide donor. So they wanted to then see, is this effect happening from nitric oxide? So they gave them a nitric oxide donor separate from what the nitric oxide that is stimulated by ultraviolet radiation exposure. And this decreased body weight and prevented the development of insulin resistance. 
Secondarily, they challenged the idea further by adding nitric, o a nitric oxide scavenger, which reversed some of the positive effects of ultraviolet radiation, specifically the benefits seen with fasting glucose levels and also hepatic steatitosis or fatty liver. It has also been observed that dietary nitrate causes the browning of white adipose, white adipose tissue. And if you're unfamiliar with what that means, it means that there is increased mitochondrial density that occurs in white adipose tissue. And this basically turns white fat into, a, it's an anti-fat mechanism. It can, the brown fat will convert triglycerides and circulating glucose into energy versus storing it as fuel. And there's a lot of different work that's now going on to see how we can stimulate the activity and also even perhaps increase the amount of brown fat that we, we hold on our body. So this information holds a mechanism. Uh, oh, and there's one other thing, by the way. Um, the increase, nitrate also increased the expression of thermogenesis-related genes in brown adipose tissue. So what we see here now is a potential mechanism and a likely mechanism for why dietary nitrate has an anti-obesity effects. Okay, so now we'll switch gears and we'll talk about POMC. POMC is a polypeptide. It is secreted by the pituitary gland, by skin cells, and also by neurons. And it undergoes cleavage into several different peptides, including uh, alpha MSH, beta endorphin, and adrenocorticotropin. So alpha MSH is quite interesting. Um, when you expose skin or the eye to ultraviolet A, it increases serum levels of alpha uh, alpha MSH in mice. And this is important because alpha MS MSH has an appetite suppressing effect. There is also a surge in alpha MSH and melanocortin for receptor expression. So how many receptors there are that receive this signal in an area of the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus, which is thought to be the center that is controlling body fatness, or one of the centers that is controlling the balance of body fatness. Okay. All right. Okay, now we'll move on and we're gonna talk about melanopsin. This is an interview that I did, uh, or this is a person who I did an interview with for the podcast Humanos Radio. His name is Peter Light. And out of the 60-some-odd professors that I've interviewed now, this definitely stands as one of the most interesting ones, uh, conversations that I've had. Dr. Light is the chief in investigator at the Light Lab at the University of Alberta and is the director of the University of Alberta's Diabetes Institute. He is a pharmacologist and a leader in the field of cellular electrical activity. His research is focused on islet signaling and diabetes, as well as developing therapies to treat diabetes and other metabolic diseases. So how did this all get started? Well, as the director of Alberta's Diabetes Institute, Dr. Light had an ongoing interest in diabetes research. And about three years earlier, he and his colleagues embarked on a project to engineer fat cells to secrete insulin. One of the challenges of uh, islet cell transplantation is that they must come from a donor and that the immune system rejects them, uh, much like they do with an organ transplant. And this necessitates the use of immunosuppressant drugs. So this research ca team came up with an idea to engineer a person's fat cells to produce insulin by inserting <clears throat> the insulin gene into fat cells and by adding an optogenetic sensor uh, channel rhodopsin, which could then be used to activate insulin release in response to light. Now, this is absolute science fiction. Uh, I started to hear research presentations about this probably about 10 years ago, maybe a little more. So what they can do is they can introduce a viral vector. It inserts these channel rhodopsin receptors into a variety of different cell tissue types, like neurons, and then you can activate those neurons by shining a light on those neurons. And it gives you great temporal specificity to be able to then turn them on and off very quickly. 
So different than pharmacology, which might be affecting different receptors, you have, it's a very good research tool to understand um, both, both how different neuron systems might interact, um, how, what happens when you just turn those on and not a, at the whole network. There's a lot of interesting things that occur here. So to do this study, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to put these receptors into fat tissue and then turn, make them insulin secreting by shining a light on them. But first they needed to do a negative control experiment. So just fly, uh, flash a light, but without adding any light sensitive options. So that would be the control. Oh, five minutes, okay. To the Q&A, cool. So they exposed the control cells to blue light and expected to see, well, no response, right? This is just the control. But instead, the light elicited a reproducible small electrical current. Hmm. So they designed some experiments to figure out what was going on. And after some deep research, they determined that the OPN4 uh, gene that encodes melanopsin is expressed in white subcutaneous adipose tissue. Once their experiments confirmed that there were opsin receptors in fat tissue, they contacted surgeons in the area to obtain skin and fat samples from cosmetic surgery patients. And sure enough, light-sensitive currents were detected within these human adipocytes. So they stumbled upon this mechanism. They then got fat tissue from humans. They tested it, and yes, they actually, when you put blue light on, these, on the fat tissue, it causes the, these electrical currents. Hmm. So they wanted to determine if there was a physiological relevance to this finding. And um, what light intensity is required to activate these pathways? And, and they had a variety of different questions. So they exposed fat cells to a range of different light, um, to light wavelengths, and they found that fat cells were maximally responsive to blue light between 450 and 480 nanometers. In order to activate these receptors, you need a very bright light, though, because only about 1 to 5% of blue light from sunlight actually penetrates the skin. Uh, usually daylight is probably adequate. Um, but blue light, unlike UV, can penetrate pretty well at different times of day. So where UV exposure is going to have maximal benefits at peak solar times between, let's say, 10 and 2, when the sun is out, blue light will, get it, will penetrate the skin really when the sun is up. Their next experiments were on a population of cells uh, with longer-term exposure to blue light. So they wanted to see, okay, what happens if we put these cells under the conditions of blue light more regularly? And they exposed the fat cells to blue light for two to four hours a day for 13 days to see how it affected the structure and the function of these adipocytes. And after 13 days of light exposure, fat cells were smaller. They were few, there were fewer cells retaining lipid droplets. In other words, they were not storing as much fat. And this is a big deal because smaller fat cells are better able to accommodate excess lipids and are less inflammatory. And generally, they are associated with better metabolic health. So larger fat cells equal higher inflammation, higher mac macrophage infiltration, and cytokine secretion. So this diminished lipid content also resulted in less secretion of adiponectin and leptin. Um, and these adipokines, which, uh, which means that they are hormones essentially that are secreted from fat tissue, are important for uh, signaling, they're, they're important signaling uh, proteins. Um, and again, their higher levels are associated with inflammation and metabolic disease. The researchers also found increased release of glycerol from the fat tissues, which suggests that the higher rate of lipolysis, or fat breakdown, was occurring in response to blue light. Overall, this suggests that blue light was changing the behavior of, these fat, tish of the fat tissue. And this is a great quote from him. I think we may have come across a potential mechanism which feeds into the concept that we may have evolved to have a mechanism which tells, uh, which, uh, which cells regulate fat storage at different times of year. So imagine during winter months when this, the, the tone and intensity of light changes, could that be a mechanism that tells the human body to store more fat for winter? Pretty interesting in light of the fact that we live indoors mostly, 90% of time indoors, and are nearly always fully clothed. Okay, so I've got one minute left. 
which is, this timing actually worked out pretty well. So we talked about the negative, negative effects of sunshine, uh, and sun damage, skin cancers, ocular issues, and some of the mechanisms. So DNA damage occurs directly through pyrimidine dimers and also through the activation of reactive oxygen species. And we also talked about how pot getting sun exposure associates with a reduced risk for various cancers, cancers that indeed are actually more deadly than skin cancers, breast, prostate, colorectal, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, certain infections, and also reduced immunity. And then we talked about a variety of different mechanisms to regulate fat metabolism, vitamin D, nitric oxide, palm C, and melanopsin. And there are, there are more. There's actually quite a lot. There's quite a bit more to say here. Um, but that is, that's the talk. There's a lot of questions that remain, and I'm happy to take some questions from the audience now. But, but I'll say a final point is that a lot of this is associational studies with mechanisms tested in animals. And I think at this point, what we need to do is to create interventional studies that give people a sensible, figure out what that is, amount of light exposure over a period of time to see how that affects a variety of things, particularly in fat, fat metabolism and um, fat regulation. And it wasn't just, so we see also mechanisms that ultraviolet radiation are having a positive effect, but it's also the blue light as well. Could there be a, a product perhaps where you wear a blue light t-shirt under your clothing that is able to then activate these blue, the, the fat receptors? I don't know, it might not be strong enough, but gosh, wouldn't that be interesting? Okay, so with that, I will stop and I'll, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your attention. All right, uh, two things. One, just real quick, uh, you mentioned uh, nanomoles per liter for vitamin D. We don't use that in the United States. That's a, uh, a metric in the United States. It's nanograms per milliliter, which is a totally different number. Uh, are you familiar with the work of John Nash Ott, who did all this? You, you need to watch. It's an old movie, uh, but it's all about how he exposed mice or rats to a number of different lights, sunlight, fluorescent light, different types of fluorescent light, Massive differences, and somebody, I mean, maybe you or somebody else, needs to reproduce what he did. The movie is up on my website. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's called Into the Light, John Nash Ott. Uh, reproduce his experiments, adding another light source, which is our new one, which is LEDs, because he showed the tremendous benefit of sunlight, the tremendous detriment of most fluorescence, but not full spectrum fluorescence. And LEDs didn't exist, and we're all switching over to LEDs, so we need some information, we need some stuff done on benefits, harm, whatever of LEDs. Yeah, I'd love to see that yeah. movie. And I think my opinion about LEDs, and of course there's a lot more information that needs to be gathered on the totality of their effects, I think that they have great potential to both do good, but they're also harmful because they're more powerful. So as technology becomes more powerful, we need to have a more sensible relationship with it. So for instance, in terms of light, you can adjust the tone and intensity of LEDs with more fidelity than you can incandescence and of course compact fluorescence. So you can imagine a smart lighting environment where the tone of light, and this, had, this has more to do with my TED talk, changes across the day so that it's reflective or at least more representative of what a natural light signature is outside at that given time. That is a step in the right direction since we're spending so much time indoors. But, of course, are there other effects that we need to know about as well? Yes. And, you know, new technology is introduced into the world. There's very little, you know, quality control mechanisms or checking. It's not evaluated for 15 years before it's released to the public. Like, all, like so, many, so much tech, it's just invented and released. And we're not going to be able to stop that. But hopefully with more information, we can then sort of either control the power of these, this technology so that we do better with it, and we can identify potential harms faster as well. But we, we, need, we need your research to come out, because I mean, I've, I've, I've reversed emotional issues by switching people over from regular lighting to either German or US-made fl full spectrum fluorescence. The Chinese ones don't do that. Mm. And now we need to find out about LEDs. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for the comment. Brilliant presentation. Um, so uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, sunlight causing aging of the skin, right? And uh, my interest is in the omega-6 fats because they accumulate in our fat and when photons of light hit those, they are going to potentially oxidize. Mm -hmm. And wondering if you have evidence to, uh, or you believe that those who consume higher PUFA diets will have faster aging of their skin. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. 
So one of the comments earlier that I mentioned was, what are the factors that affect a person's, an individual's response to the solar radiation that they're exposed to? And one of those factors, which could be an entirely different presentation, is on dietary factors, including supplementation of vitamin D. So let me make a, a quick comment about what I would consider a very regular common pattern of sun exposure. We don't get much sun exposure. When we do get sun exposure, because we've had so little, we have little vit circulating vitamin D. 75% of the United States and over a billion people worldwide have low vitamin D status. That itself is protective of sun exposure. So we get out there, we get burns. We have this binge and purge relationship with sun. Would it make sense to maintain a low level tan across the year, even if it includes the use of some sunbeds? Possibly, and there is some evidence that even the sensible use of sunbeds could actually be beneficial for people in higher latitudes or people that just can't get full body sun exposure. Now this might not be the type of, it might be more therapeutic where you're just getting very little amount, five minutes a day or a couple times a week versus going out, you know, really trying to get a, maximize your tan. And then what, kind, what, what would make up a good solar bed? We know that UVB is what causes tanning. A lot of the nitric oxide benefits, however, come from UVA. So again, going back to the comment I made is that we need a lot more research here. I think so much of it has been focused on, the, the preponderance has been around skin cancer. But our rates of skin cancer might have a lot to do with the diet we're eating, including the phytochemicals that we're taking in that help, in, that help shore up our DNA repair mechanisms and reduce, oxida reduce the damage from oxidative stress. If we're consuming, if we have a lifestyle and diet that predisposes us to not be able to hand those types of stressors well, then the stressor, which might ordinarily be helpful, might end up looking unhealthful in the context of the modern lifestyle. So thank you for that comment. Thank you. Very, very interesting. I do think that um, that is one area that I'd like to see more work on. Thanks for your presentation. I was just wondering, as I, I see a lot of fatty liver disease in practice nowadays, and it's my understanding that vitamin D production is, is actually done in the liver. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on uh, lack of vitamin D. I mean, you've say, stated that you think it's because we're indoors, but I see a lot of patients that in the fall, they spend a lot of time outdoors, and yet in the fall, I'll measure the vitamin D, and it's deficient. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's due to the fatty liver disease. Yes. That is entirely a possibility, and it's one thesis that we consume vitamin D, we either produce, produce it less efficiently, or we are consuming it in conditions that are high, higher inflammatory conditions. So that's a very interesting comment, and I'll repeat what he said, that there are people that are getting sun exposure, but there's still low vitamin D status. So is it either underproduction, or is it that we are perhaps consuming it more through some inflammatory processes? So there, one very interesting study that just came out gave people that were pre-diabetic very high dose, five to 10 times the recommended amount, and it, showed, it slowed the progression of diabetes. So while we do see some, the evidence for giving vitamin D has been underwhelming in terms of meta-analyses, we are also seeing some positive signs there, but then we all, so I, I do think that there are some positive effects from vitamin D, but it also might be a marker for other, for sun exposure, which then might be having other effects like nitric oxide, melanopsin, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Time for one more question. So you mentioned in supplementing with vitamin D. I'm curious what your thoughts are on supplementing with other natural agents, such as astaxanthin, for natural sun protection. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, do yeah. you still get the benefits of the sun while supplementing with that? Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, that is one of the dietary factors, astaxanthins. Uh, luteolin, or, or lutein, excuse me, uh, zeaxanthins, NAD, uh, nicotinamide precursors, fenugreek, a, a, a variety of rosminic acids from rosemary. Lots of things, a lot of phytochemicals will have an effect by increasing the, our ability to handle oxidative stress. Interestingly, taking antioxidants directly in the forms of beta carotene, vitamin E and C, they've had, the data there is actually not very clear. In fact, if, you're, if you were to pluck out what you think is happening is that direct antioxidants don't seem to be having a beneficial effect, but rather inducing 
your body to produce antioxidants through these small hormetic stressors of plant phytochemicals seems to be a, a, a much better approach. And there is evidence for, for this being, in fact, there are even some products out there that are considered oral sunblocks, like Fernblock or HelioCare. And then there's a different combination of them. But I think you could sensibly create a combination of different compounds that address different mechanisms that made the stress events of solar exposure not, not only not damaging, but you would prevent the damage and you'd get the benefits. That's my hope. That's my hope. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah.